Good morning. Thank you for joining us on the Mars Hill Cumberland Presbyterian Church broadcast. Um, just a couple of reminders. Um, stay tuned on the Facebook page every Monday and Friday. Um, on Mondays, we're going to be posting. Uh, Mondays, we've been posting and we'll continue to post uh, questions and answers from the Cumberland Presbyterian Church Catechism. Um, and then on Fridays, we post quotes from the Cumberland Presbyterian Church Confession of Faith. And we post those just so you can kind of uh, read them and reflect over them and study them uh, in your own personal time. Because we, you know, we want to be aware of what we believe and why we believe it. The, I think the vast majority of the problem of the church today is that we really don't understand what it is we believe or why. We just kind of go along with it. You know, there's a lot of people who, who say, you know, I, I was born Cumberland Presbyterian and I'll die Cumberland Presbyterian. They have no idea what that means. Just like there's a lot of people who say, I was born Baptist, I'll die Baptist, and they don't even know what that means. And we don't want to be like that. We want to be people who know what we believe and why we believe it. We want to be able to defend it with the Word of God. And so that's why that's why we do that. Um, there was another thing I was going to uh, announce or remind you of, and now I can't remember what it was. I'll, um, who knows? Uh, but this morning what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, we're going to sing. start off by singing a hymn. We're going to sing Praise to the Lord the Almighty. And uh, some of you will know that, some of you might not. Um, if you know it, sing along with us at home. Uh, if you don't know it, then learn a new hymn with us. Uh, if I can find where the text is on my phone. Here it is. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Come all who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord above all things so wondrously reigning. Sheltering you under his wings and gently sustaining. Have you not seen all that is needful has been sent by his gracious ordaining? Praise to the Lord who will prosper your work and defend you. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attend you. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. If with his love he befriends you. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that has life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for every adore him. All right. <clears throat> oh, I remember what it was. Um, we are. Uh, I've already posted the Sunday school video for this week. Um, I normally I post that every Sunday at noon. Today I was having trouble with the uh, publishing tools on Facebook, so I just went ahead and posted the link for the Sunday school video. So be sure to to watch that in addition to uh, this morning's message. And another thing, um, if you're watching, let us know you're watching by leaving a comment, leave an amen if you like something. You know, just let us know you're watching because all Facebook does is give us numbers, right? 
it, it gives us the number of uh, people who are watching and it gives us the number of people who viewed the video. Uh, but people are not numbers and we care about people and we care less about numbers. And so if, if you know, if you're a person, <laughs> if you're a person watching this, uh, leave us a comment and let us know you're watching. And if you, if you would like, reach out to us and, uh, We'll be more than happy to, to contact you and talk with you. Um, because these, these videos are actually reaching a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people who watch these uh, videos do, don't show up on Sunday morning for whatever reason. And so we want to keep them in the loop. We want to keep them connected. And I've seen, I've seen other churches, uh, Cumberland Presbyterian churches actually, where uh, people have been watching their videos who aren't even in, who don't even live in their state, don't even live in their country, don't even live in their region, and they have stayed, and the church has stayed connected with them through their online services and their online videos, and we want to be able to do that too. We want to, you know, we our church is located in Pottsville, Arkansas, but we want to have a reach outside Pottsville. Uh, we love the people in Pottsville. We want to serve the people in Pottsville, but we want to have an impact and a reach beyond that. If we can, and this is, and Facebook is a great way to do that. So leave us a comment. Let us know you're watching. Um, Zelda, good morning to you too. We we love we love Kirk and Zelda. Um, they went to another church that that we pastored. We love them. Um, so thank you for watching. Uh, good morning, Tessa. Good morning, Sparks family. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us this morning. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 1. I decided to try a little, something a little different. Um, I have preached through books of the Bible before. For those of you uh, who attended Mars Hill over the last summer, uh, you know that we walked through the book of Ephesians together, and that took about 17 to 19 weeks. I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to go through the entire book of Isaiah. But I'm going to do it differently in that I'm not going to cover every verse and every section like we did with Ephesians. Instead, what I'm going to do with Isaiah is I'm going to just cover a chapter at a time. And I'm going to cover kind of the main bits and pieces from that chapter. And hopefully what this will do is it will give you a... Uh, It'll give you, it'll whet your appetite to study the book of Isaiah for yourself and dig out all the nuggets that are in there. And to really see the gospel and how God works uh, through the prophet Isaiah here and how he speaks to us today. Because the word of God isn't simply limited to the time and place in which it was written. It has power beyond the time and place it was written. It has power in our day. And we want to see the word of God at work in our day, even though it was written so many hundreds of thousands of years ago. We want to see the uh, Word of God at work today in our lives, and so we, we, study, we study the Word. And so we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 1, and we're going to read the entire chapter. And so this is going to be 31 verses. And so if you were, if you were actually at church this morning, if you, uh, if you were in church this morning um, at my church, if we were doing in-person services, so to say, um, I would not make you stand up for all of this because this is a pretty lengthy read. Uh, so Isaiah chapter 1, and we're going to read all 31 verses. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Hear the word of the Lord. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backwards. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints. From sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed up or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, strangers devour your land and your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, 
as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the, in the blood of bulls or the lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts, to bring no more futile sacrifices? Incense is an abomination in me or it is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, and now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and followers after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance upon my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitence with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together. And those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed for they will be ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired, and you shall be embarrassed because of the garden which you have chosen. For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaves fades, and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tender, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them. This ends the reading of God's word, the word of God, for the people of God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, grant that as your servants, as we your servants, hear you, grant that we hear your word for us today. Let us know that it is for us and it is for our reproof, our rebuke, and our correction. If you didn't love us, you wouldn't correct us. By your word, let us be assured that we are your children. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. How many of you remember sword drill from Sunday school? Basically, the Sunday school teacher would list off some scriptures, and the first kid to find all the scriptures and read them would be the winner of the sword drill. This morning, if we were to have a round of sword drill, and I had you look up the, the passage we just read, as well as uh, Isaiah 58, Hosea 4, Hosea 6, Micah 6, and Malachi 1, you might notice that there would be an obvious common theme in all those chapters. In all those passages, and in plenty of others, God rejects the worship of his people. Now, why would he do now why would God do that do something like that? Why would he reject worship from his people? He told them how to worship. He gave them the songs to sing and the prayers to pray in worship. He gave them the temple to worship in, but in plenty of places he describes the worship as being an abomination. Even our text this morning says, Your new moons and feasts my soul hates. So what's the matter? What's the problem? Why is God rejecting the worship that he commands? Well, God's not the problem. 
and the worship that he commands isn't the problem. The problem is the people. One year when I was pastoring at another church, we went to the Christmas Eve service, and after our Christmas program, my wife and I went to visit my grandparents. We got a bite to eat, and then we attended midnight mass uh, at a church that had a very formal liturgy. Everything was very ornate and beautiful. We even chanted the psalms, and I love chanting the psalms. If I could teach our people at, at Mars Hill to teach the, to chant the psalms, I would. I just love it. Um, it's it, you. You haven't been to church until you've heard Psalm ninety six chanted by a bunch of people, and yeah, it's it's great. But I loved it. I thoroughly enjoyed the service, and I asked Brittany what she thought, and she said everything was nice, but there wasn't a bit of God in that place. And unfortunately, I had to agree with her. Everything was beautiful. The sermon was very good. The priest proclaimed Christ and him crucified. Everything in the service pointed to Christ as the way of salvation. So what was missing? What was missing was the actual looking to Christ. And here's what I mean. All of the signs can point in the right direction. All of the signs can point in the right direction. But unless you actually walk in the right direction that the signs are pointing, it does you no good. Unless you actually repent and follow Christ and imitate him, the sermons you hear, the services you attend, the, the live streams you tune into, none of that will do you any good. One of the most common complaints I've heard about the public school system is that they're not actually teaching children anything relevant or life-changing. They're just teaching them how to pass tests so that the schools can get more funding from the government. And I'm not sure how, how true that is. However... I feel like this is sometimes how we approach Christianity. We're not actually trying to follow Christ. We're just trying to learn enough and do enough to pass the test so we can make the cut to get into heaven. How sad is that? How depraved and crazy is that? If we get nothing else from this text this morning, we should understand that that's just absolutely not how it works. God's not going to be standing there with a clipboard and pen ready to give us a, a passing or failing percentage. See, God wants everything. He wants all of our love. He wants all of our devotion. He wants all of our attention. Jesus died for all of us, and I sure can't think of any reason why he shouldn't get what he paid for. So this morning, we're going to talk about what God requires of us under the title, When Worship is Wrong. When worship is wrong, there is a severe lack of two things. There is, number one, a lack of repentance, and number two, there is a lack of justice. Think about it like this. Repentance is the key to your relationship with God, and justice is the key to your relationship with others. Okay? I'll say that again. Repentance is the key to your relationship with God, and justice is the key to your relationship with others. That should be easy to remember, because what does Jesus say that the two greatest commandments are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So we're to love God and we're to love other people. And repentance is the key to our relationship with God and justice is the key to our relationship with other people. So, but before we talk about, now before we get too deep into the ideas of repentance and justice. Notice how God starts this message. Look back at Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10. Notice what he says. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. This obviously isn't addressed to Sodom and Gomorrah. God is speaking to his own people, but he addresses them by the names of these godless pagan societies of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because he's trying to get their attention. He's saying, you're acting just like these people. Your sin is no more acceptable than theirs was. So what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Think about it. When we, when we think about those two places, our minds immediately go to sexual immorality, the homosexuality, the perversion. But, but they didn't start out with those sins. It got to that point, but they didn't start out there. Ezekiel paints a different picture. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, this is what the Bible says. It says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, 
an abundance of idleness, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Their sins started because they were selfish. They kept hoarding their resources. They wouldn't strengthen the hand of the poor. And so what did God do? He caused them to turn inward on themselves. Because that's what happens whenever a society or a people or a person on an individual level rejects God. They begin to turn inward on themselves. And they begin the process of, of that downward spiral that Paul talks about in, in Romans chapter 1. According to Romans 1, the wrath of God is against those who suppress the truth of the knowledge of God. And eventually God gave them up to their own affections. And what were they most affectionate for? Themselves. They were full of people who said, if we share our own resources, people would just want handouts. Yeah, how dare those hungry people want food, right? How dare the needy actually need things? How inconvenient for us? How selfish of them, right? It's full of those kinds of people. And so God allowed them to turn inward on themselves. And the wrath of God poured down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And so now when we fast forward to Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah is talking to Israel. He's talking to the people of God, and he calls them not by, the, not by the name of Israel, not by the name of Judah, not by the name of Jerusalem. He calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. So in Isaiah 1, when God says, listen, Sodom, this, is, this word is for you, he's telling them you're doing the same thing they were doing, and you won't get away with it either. Brett Younger, um, he says that he's a Bible scholar, he says this about uh, the context of Isaiah's message. He says, During Isaiah's time, the temple in Jerusalem was standing room only. No one missed a service. They sang psalms, old ones, new ones, all kinds of psalms. They said prayers and gave offerings. But what they did not do was let worship trouble their consciences. If they kept their distance from God, then they could also keep their distance from God's children. They did not want to make connections between their worship and their neighbors. They ignored the poor and everyone else they wanted to ignore. I'll say that last part again. What they did not do was let worship trouble their consciences. Think about that. There are many people today who go to church every Sunday, or, you know, during the pandemic, we tune into church every Sunday. There are people who go to church every Sunday and they don't let worship trouble their consciences. They don't make connections between their worship and their neighbors, or, or what I would say is they don't make connections between their worship and their actions. Mm. They don't let Sunday affect Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. How many times do we do this? It's easy to come to church, tune into the broadcast week after week, throw some money at the church and call it done, but it's hard when what is preached actually needs to be applied to your life. There's an old story. Uh, this isn't in my notes. I'm just kind of remembering this. There's an old story told by B.H. Clendenin. And, uh, you know, B.H. Clendenin was a Pentecostal preacher, and he said that he went to go hold revival at this church. And the pastor said, oh man, our church is geared up for revival. We've been having services where people shout the house down. People are speaking tongues all over the place. You know, it, our church is just geared up for revival. Well, B.H. Clinton comes in there. He starts preaching not after night, but he's preaching hard. He's preaching hard against sin. He's, you know, this, this was back in the 60s. He's preaching hard against the sins of today. He's preaching against adultery, homosexuality. He's preaching against uh, thievery. He's preaching against all these kinds of sins. And he doesn't know why he's preaching these hard, hard sermons. He's preaching against hypocrisy. And he, he doesn't understand why God's giving, these hard, giving him these hard messages to preach. And... Then the last night of revival, the pastor said, oh, tonight, tonight's the last night of revival, so what we're going to do is we're going to close out the service by taking communion together. Brother Clinton and said, okay, that's fine. And uh, he prayed about what to preach that night, and God gave him a text from, I think it was First or Second Peter, it's where Peter says, uh, judgment must begin at the house of God. And so he preached that one verse, judgment must begin at the house of God. And when he got done preaching, everyone was silent. 
there was just a, there was just a, you could hear a pin drop. And he turned around to hand the service back over to the pastor, and the pastor was actually cowering behind the pulpit. He was down in the floor, cowering behind the pulpit. He looked up at Brother, Brother Clinton and he said, you've killed us all. And then there was a shriek from the back of the church. And there was a woman who ran up to the ran up to the front of the church and threw a bunch of hundred dollar bills on on the altar and she said, I, I need to repent. I've been trying to starve the pastor out. There was another man who ran up to the altar. Him and his wife ran up with him. They both ran up to the altar and she and they they were crying and they were repenting and when the pastor went to go pray with him, they uh, the husband had confessed that he had been having an affair for years. And there were people who were just all over the sanctuary. Their hearts were broken and they were repenting. They were coming to church Sunday after Sunday. And it looked like they were on fire for God. They were doing all the right things. They were doing all the right motions. They were going through all the right motions. But their hearts were not right with God. I don't want us to be that way. If you know Jesus died for all of us, and so he should get and he paid the price, he poured his blood out for us, he poured his blood out for all of us, and he should get what he paid for. And so that's and so that's what Isaiah is addressing this morning. You know, people think, well, we can just keep showing up, doing what we've always done, God will understand, but that's not what that's not what Isaiah says. And that's not what the prophet Amos says. If you look in Amos chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, Amos says, Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Bring a thank offering of leavened bread and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for you love to do so, O people of Israel, says the Lord God. Amos says, go ahead, keep coming to church, piling on your lifeless religion as a cheap knockoff for true religion, and see how far it gets you. According to the Bible, there's two kinds of religion. There's true religion, James 1.27, tells us that religion that God accepts is to care for widows and orphans, and then there's false religion. False religion is the kind we see God's people doing over and over again, trying to use as a substitute for true religion. True religion involves repentance. True religion involves justice. False religion is the kind the apostle talks about when he says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So here's the first point. When worship is wrong, there is a lack of repentance. We sometimes might think of repentance as the, as the diving board that we use to dive into our walk with God. But biblically speaking, our, our walk with God is, is, is a life of constant repentance. We, we think of it like this. You know, there's a big swimming pool, and let's, let's pretend this big swimming pool is your walk with God. And then there's a diving board, and you jump off the diving board, and you get into the pool, and we think that repentance is that diving board. But that's not the case. Repentance is actually the whole swimming pool. You begin... You're, you begin your walk with God by repentance, and it's continual repentance. You, it's not that you're getting born again, it's over and over again. It's that you're continually reevaluating your life, and you're saying, God, I have things in me that are not of you, and I want you to drive them out. I want you to push them out. I want you to convict me of my sin. And so that's what repentance is. That's what renewal is. That's whenever in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when Paul says that, when Paul says that he wants us to be renewed by renewed daily, be renewed by the transforming of our mind, that's a daily process. That's an ongoing process. That's repentance. And so, this is what we see Isaiah calling for. Repentance isn't a one-time ordeal. It's not something we do to jumpstart our Christian life and then move on to bigger and better things. We are always looking to Christ. We are always turning away from our sin. Martin Luther opened the Reformation by nailing the 95 Theses to the, to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And the very first of these theses stated, Our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. As Christians, we may be fairly sure 
that we know what repenting and repentance looks like. But in Isaiah 1, God lays out what our repentance looks like. These are the necessary steps we have to take in our repentance. He says in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. These two verses basically have three components. He says, he says, wash yourselves clean. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil from before my eyes. He said, this is, this is the beginning of repentance. You look to Christ, and in looking to Christ, your eyes are turned away from your sin, or as Isaiah says, your evil doings, and your eyes especially aren't on yourself. I think we miss that part of re repentance sometimes. We may try to take our eyes off of our sin, but then we look at ourselves. We, we look at ourselves trying to keep track of how well we're doing at getting rid of our sin, and that doesn't work either. You have to look to Christ. You have to look to Christ, and looking to Christ means preaching the gospel to yourself. This is what Joe Thorne says in, in his book, Note to Self. He says, Preaching to ourselves is the personal act of applying the law and the gospel to our own lives with the aim of experiencing the transforming grace of God, leading to ongoing faith, repentance, and greater godliness. It is critically important to sit under the preaching of the word in your local church. Additionally, we can listen to podcasts and read books, but even in the midst of all this listening, it is not enough to hear. We must take the word preached and continue to preach it to ourselves. So, and then the second part of what Isaiah says there, cease to do evil, learn to do good. That's a tall order. And it sounds obvious, but God wants to make sure we understand what repentance means. It's also interesting to me that God says, stop doing evil and learn to do good. He doesn't say, stop learning to do evil and do good. We don't have to learn to do evil, right? We're naturally inclined that way. That's what we naturally do when we're apart from God, evil. Evil is what we're naturally drawn to when we allow our sin to separate us from God. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is, is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. If you want to invite chaos into your life, just ignore God for a while. If you want destruction, just live on your own terms. People do this all the time when they say, man, I'm free, I can do anything I want. But here's the problem with that line of thinking. Dan Michael Kogan says it best when he said that if, you, if what you call freedom includes continuing in your sin, then what you call freedom is actually the biblical definition of captivity. See, many people believe that when they live life on their own terms, apart from God, that they're free, but really they're in captivity. They're in bondage. And only God can set them free from that bondage, and he's provided a way to do that in Jesus. And the third thing about this text is he says, Seek justice, re rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. So far, God tells them to repent, and he says, If you're going to repent, then you do it by putting away evil. And learning to do good. And then he says, if you're going to learn to do good, this is how you do it. So God gives us a game plan. He says, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Why? Because this is the religion that God accepts. This is what, you know, th these are the things that, these are the things that if affect our lives. So on Sunday morning, we come to church, we, we participate in singing, we hear the scriptures read, we hear the scriptures preached, we may take the Lord's Supper, and then what do we do afterwards? We should let what happens on Sunday morning influence the way we think and act the rest of the week. And that's the religion that God accepts. We said it earlier, God isn't, God isn't against the worship that goes on in the temple. He invented their worship, and he commands their worship. He wasn't against it, but the worship that was going on in the temple was made meaningless by what was going on outside of the temple. So what God is against is God is against meaningless worship. Our worship Sunday after Sunday is good, but it can easily be made meaningless by our attitudes and actions when we live when, when we leave here, when we leave worship and forget God and live life on our own terms. 
And I pray that we never say things like, well, we don't need we don't need those kinds of people in our church or we can't help people because they'll just want a handout. I don't I don't want us to say things like that. When we read Isaiah 1, when we read Micah 6, when we read Malachi 1, when we read Isaiah 59, we can't just sit back in our easy chair and say, well, you know, those stupid Israelites, they just didn't get it. No, we have to say, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We have to let the Word of God confront us where we are and convict us of our sin and show us where we're, show us where we're coming up short. We need to let the Word of God confront us, and it's only by allowing the Word of God to confront us will we be transformed by that Word. Mm-hmm. Will we want to do what God has us to do? God calls for repentance and justice, and justice not on just an individual level, but on a corporate level. When God spoke in the Old Testament, he spoke to his people as a whole. In the New Testament, when Paul would rebuke the churches, he would rebuke them as a whole. Was it because every single person was faithless? Maybe not. He reprimands his people as a whole because our sanctification is a community project. If you, you know, that may sound strange, but look at Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 15, or 12 to 15. Hebrews 3, 12 to 15, he says, Beware, brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So what what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's taking this situation from the Old Testament where, where many of God's people hardened their hearts and they rebelled against Moses. He's taking this situation and he's saying, don't be like them. Don't harden your hearts. But today every day, take into account what you believe, why you believe it, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and and bring that under the submission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, he says, don't do this lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And so what, what does Paul, or what does the writer of Hebrews mean when he says that? He means, don't Take, he said, don't, don't disbelieve God. Whenever God says he wants to do something in your life, whenever God says he has a job for you to do, take God on his word. When God says he wants to create a transformed people, then believe God. We don't, don't look at the commands of God. Don't look at the things that Jesus requires and say, well, I can't do that. I can't live up to that, so I might as well not even try. Believe God, take God at his word, and look to Jesus and allow him to transform your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of meat on that bone, and it will preach, but the main idea is clear. We are to preach to one another. We are to hold one another accountable. So so think about this. Think about this. Exhort one another daily. What's your job as an individual? Like, what, what is your job as an individual Christian? Exhort fellow Christians. Don't, you know, it doesn't mean you beat them over the head, but say, hey, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? Here's a scripture I read this morning. Maybe, maybe you'll get something out of it, too. Help one another. Listen, it's not, it's not the pastor's job. It's not the preacher's job to, to encourage one another without everyone else encouraging each other, right? I, I can't do it all. I, I physically can't be there with you every day. Well, I mean, especially now in a pandemic. But I can't physically be with everyone every day, encouraging one another every day. We need to take care of one another. We're a family, right? And so what do families do? Families check in on one another. We say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? How can I help you? How can I minister to you today? Do that. Remind people of their confession. Remind people of their confidence in Christ. And when you do that, you build one another up. And we, when we encourage one another and pray for one another and check in on one another, it, you, you know, it builds our faith up. Now, if we go back to Isaiah 1, we'll, go, we'll see one more thing. When worship is wrong, there is a lack of justice. 
Notice verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Back in 2010, back in 2010, uh, Glenn Beck got on his TV program and he told his viewers that if their pastor spoke about social justice, then they needed to find a different church. I would probably amend that statement and tell you that if you attend a church where the pastor speaks about justice incorrectly, then you should find a different church. Because the Bible does speak about justice. We can't avoid it. We can't think that justice is a dirty word just because some people out there uh, somewhere abuse it. And according to Isaiah 1, justice is what needs to be done for our relationships to be restored with those around us. Justice means taking care of one another. Justice means meeting one another's needs. Justice means living in community for the sake of the community around us, not just not just for nice farmhouses around us. This means that we actually go out of our way to help one another and check in on one another. And you know what? Sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes it can be inconvenient. People are inconvenient. Jesus wouldn't have told us to love one another so much if it weren't a challenge. But we love because he first loved us. And every time we refuse to love others, it's because we've forgotten how much he loved us. Jesus didn't wait for you to get your act together. He loved you where you were, and he loves you where you are now. God's people were hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and the rebellion, and he still loved them. Normally, when I think about God feeding his people, I think about it in the context of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and that's true. God does feed us in the sacraments. But how many of you have ever been on the verge of not having enough to eat, and God gave you groceries? How many of you ever have... How many of you have ever, you know, eaten sandwiches made with government cheese that God provided for you when you had nothing else? You know, recently we had some bills, unexpected bills come up, and it and and me being irresponsible, I forgot to pay a couple bills on time, and uh, we were just we were just thinking, oh no, how are we going to get through the the week, you know, and then. Like the next day, my paycheck came in from the encounter for writing lessons. And I was like, oof, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and so God provided for us. When you think about how much God has been good to you, why would you ever want to withhold that kind of goodness from others? So what's the answer? What do we do? How do we respond to this word in an appropriate manner? Well, this is what Isaiah tells us to do in verses 18 to 20. He says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So first, God invites us to reason with him. God doesn't reason with us the way we reason with one another. When we reason with one another, we sit down, we make out some reasonable compromises that uh, make both parties happy, and then, the, then we end the deal by shaking on it, right? However, when God reasons with us, all of the terms and conditions are his. He doesn't consult us to see what would make us happy. He tells, he tells us the things to do that will make us holy, and then he says, if you do these things... If you turn away from sin and you learn to do good and seek justice for your neighbor, then you'll eat the good of the land. So what does that look like? It looks like what it did in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus spoke the Beatitudes. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. See, those aren't just pithy little sayings that we uh, cross-stitch onto pillows. These are real promises about a real kingdom to real people. The question is, are we that people? Are we going to be poor in spirit and mourn over our sin? Are we going to be meek and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? Or are we going to be like the people of Israel in Malachi's day and say, Wherein have we wearied God? Wherein have we dishonored God? 
Are we going to hunger and thirst for righteousness, or are we going to say, no, I, I don't need more righteousness. I'm fine on my own. The message is clear. Repent and be clothed in God's righteousness, and make sure that you clear the way so that others can be clothed in his righteousness as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is pure and true and it is for us. We have a responsibility to repent of our sins and look to Christ and seek justice for our neighbor so that we can see your love and your kindness. Lord, send us the Holy Spirit to empower us to do these things. Because we can't do these things in and of ourselves. It's hard. Life is hard. The responsibilities that we have are hard. But Lord, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And so, Lord, we want to take your we want to take your yoke upon us. We want to learn from you. And in learning from you, God, let us imitate you. Let us encourage one another. Let us admonish one another. Lord, let us be armed with the Word of God so that we can. Take it to those who are closest to us, those around us, and so that we can equip one another. Lord, you, you created us to be a family. You didn't create us to be members of a social club. You created us to be a family, and families love one another, and families check in on each other. So, Lord... Empower us by your Spirit to function as your family. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to close out this morning by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.